Aren't you glad this morning that his love never fails? I love this song and I love the message of this song. Because at the end of the day, everything we've got in God comes back to his love over and over and over. Praise God. Higher than the mountains that I made. Stronger than the power of the trial and the Several years, then there's a ministry called Double Honor, 
and they partner with pastoral care, and they invite pastors to just come to a place. That, in this case, it was Branson. They do it different places across the country, to cabins or lakes or all kinds of stuff. But we stayed all together in a house, and we made four of the best couple, couples, friends, that we've ever had. By the time we got through supper on Monday night, two of those couples were like, like we've known them our whole lives, like we just hadn't been together in a while. The other two couples we connected and bonded with over the days. But I'm telling you, God blessed us this week with, with laughter and love and connection. And we just, you know, we had such a wonderful time. And, and uh, I'm thankful to this church for loving us and supporting us the way that you do. Um, and it was just a privilege to get to go. It was something that I wasn't sure about. and We didn't have plans for, you know, our actual vacation we took to after we did the wedding and we traveled all over. Uh, all of that kind of come together, and I'm, I'm grateful and I appreciate so much the, the love of this church to let us do stuff like this because it was an extra thing, but uh, God provided bless. As a result of it, we've got lifelong, friends, well, eternity long friends that, um, that God, is, God has blessed us with, and we had such a wonderful time. So thank you um, to everyone that was praying for us, loving on us while we were gone. And um, we're glad to be back home, but we are, of course, we brought home two hitchhikers we picked up in Tulsa. We got Lily and Jameson with us for the week, and we're, we're so glad and excited about that. And Taven back home, and we're just having a ball and enjoying ourselves. And, and uh, we had a little birthday party last night. Thank you to those that came and loved on Taven the way you did. And her birthday is Tuesday. I didn't manage to get on our calendar, but her birthday is this Tuesday. And she'll be all of three, so happy birthday to Miss Taven. Oh, she, well, I was trying to get her to cheer up. Three years old on Tuesday. And we've been celebrating this already, so we're, uh, we're blessed and excited. There's actually, you'll get to enjoy a birthday cake for her today if you stay for fellowship. Um, if you don't stay for fellowship, sorry, I can't help you. It's, uh, that's out of my hands. It's just the way it has to be. But uh, this is Fellowship Sunday. It's also Building Fun Sunday, so when you, when you put your tithes and offerings in the box, please include that if you would. And uh, make sure missions and other things like that. Okay, I've got to write a check for last month because when I was gone, I didn't write one. I looked at the, the, the deal in there, and I'm like, that was short. And the reason it was short because the pastor forgot to put his check in the box before he left town. So I will make that up and make sure we have that because that, that matters to me more than just about any other money we give. Tithe is important, but we've got, to give, we've got to bless those missionaries besides that tithe because we've not given God anything until we tithe. Thank God somebody said amen right there. I'm so... Uh, if y'all left me hanging right there, we might have just prayed and went on to, well, to lunch. Or, you know, I'm, I, I wasn't, you're not going to eat my pork roast if, if you didn't, couldn't get at me in that. So. But uh, we are so blessed. And I'm telling you, God just filled us up and encouraged us and uh, blessed us so much over the course of this week. My brother's home. What's, what's, what, what we're at that point. Let's talk about that. Uh, our prayer list this morning. We'll update you here on a couple of things. Donna Edwards uh, will eventually be at Maple Heights. They're waiting on a placement right now. Um, there's not a spot there for her at this point, but um, she is dealing with, with uh, like Alzheimer's, dementia type things. And it's, it got, her last time with us, it, got, it, was, it was pretty difficult. But uh, after that, Wade had to deal with some things. So I encourage you to pray for Donna and Wade when you pray for Donna. And I believe God to restore her and bless her. Uh, she is much better, but she's still going to have to be, uh, still going to have to be in the, in the nursing home. So. Uh, pray that, that, that they'll get that open where she'll be closer to home. Because right now, until they get her placement here, she's going to be in Kansas City or Oakland Park. So it's, it's just the only options they have. So prayers for Donna and Wade. God bless and be with them. Lily Provo is home. She had a fall. If you remember from last week, she had a fall and had a punctured lung and a couple other serious things. Spent some time in Topeka at the hospital. She is home recovering, so thank God for that. My brother Mike is doing well. He is out of the hospital. Uh, he is back home, and through a series of events that, that uh, God just kind of worked and moved, we, uh, we got him home and got things, things working there. I encourage you to pray for he and Sandra. That's how I'd like to ask you just simply to, to pray for he and Sandra and just leave it there as, a, as, a, as an unspoken of sorts, and I believe God to bless and, and touch that situation. Tony French has had an episode this morning with his heart, and then Haley Seabin this morning for a touch from the Lord. So those are the needs I have. That's been I've been made aware of. Do you have anything else to share with us today? About anything or an update of something, Debbie? Too unspoken for Debbie. All right, remember Debbie this morning. Anybody else? Did I see another hand there. Thought I did. All right. Well, let's uh, continue to pray God's blessing over our country. Um,
Springfield, Missouri, North Arkansas, the, the hospital where my brother was is, a, is also a COVID hotspot. All of their COVID rooms are full. Sharon's sisters and niece had it. One of them was in the hospital briefly. You may have seen Doris. Uh, she is home, doing better, and um, we're thankful for that. But uh, a lot of people sick throughout southern Missouri and North Arkansas, a lot of places in the country right now. And uh, let's believe God to get all that back under control here in our county as well. I know the last numbers I saw, seven total cases, four that Delta, uh, two Alpha, and then one, uh, one that's just COVID. But um, one is one too many. We're believing God to get us back and restore us here and, and not have the issues that they're having so many places. And they'll stop having issues they're having so many places um, so that we can get, you know, we we're about a three weeks or three or four weeks from school starting. And this kind of thing right now would be, would be devastating to our kids. I'm telling you, we, those kids need to be in school across this country. But, but um, lots of things like that that may, may run into trouble here because of this stuff. So I want us to pray. Also pray for our kids. Kids Revival starts next Sunday evening at 6 o'clock, uh, Sunday night through Wednesday night, 1st of August to the 4th of August. And we are going to have a ball. And uh, we're looking forward to that. I may have everything done and decorated next Sunday morning. And I may foolishly wait till Sunday afternoon to do it. Probably we'll have it ready for you. When you come in Sunday morning, you'll see the whole set. And um, I've, been, I've been told that Clyde needs to, ha needs to be a part of this, so there'll be the full puppet stage and all that. But we're going to have a great time. Like those kids, invite your neighbors, share the post on Facebook that I made. I'm going to make another one, probably do a little ad and all that kind of stuff this week. Let's pray for souls of children, families, moms and dads. I think one of the greatest things we could ever celebrate would be the fact that we had kids saved and had grandparents saved all in the same building. God can do it. And we can do that and have a good time with it. And God's going to bless us in our, in our, our kids' revival this next week. It's going to be good. It's going to be a lot of fun. Most importantly, souls will be saved. And that's, that's the bottom line. That's everything that matters to me. So let's stand this morning. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for these needs and these situations. Let's believe God today for his Holy Spirit to touch us. Father, in the name of Jesus, today we are grateful for your many blessings. And God, for, for new friends that we got to make this week. And Lord, I pray your blessing on those pastors this morning that are standing in the pulpit like I am. Anoint them, bless them, touch them. Touch Brother Bob, Donnie. And uh, Scott, this morning, Lord, and bless Les and his life, and, and Jim Fuller, who helped us all come together, that you continue to bless the ministry of pastoral care and double honor. Today, Father, I speak blessings, Lord Jesus, over Debbie, for her body, her life, for the unspoken needs on her heart. Touch Lori, Father God, that, that she'd get the answers and the healing she needs. Touch Amber, and bless Donna and Wade, and speak life, peace, and strength over them. Lord, I believe today for Shirley and Louise and Tanya. Bless Craig and Loretta Lee, and speak your blessing over Amanda and Becky over Brianna and Cindy and Gail. And Father, I lift up Jeremy today. Touch Lily Provo, oh God. I speak against pain and issues she may still be having. I ask you to bless Touch Michael and give him healing and restoration. Father God, body, mind, and spirit. Bless he and Sandra, Lord, for the, the work that needs to be done in their hearts and lives. And I speak blessings today over Pam, over Ray, and over Ray Hunter. Bless uh, Adam's grandchildren, Father God, in their circumstances. And touch Dee today, Father God. And I, I believe for Tony French, Lord, for touching his body. Touch Haley today, Father God, for restoration and blessing. And Lord, I speak, God, over this, this community, over this state and this country. God, we speak wisdom and blessing over our leadership. And Lord, I pray today, God, that this, this, COVID, this COVID virus, Lord, would be gone. In Jesus' name, that you would bring this thing to, to an end. And Father, that by your spirit and by your power, your healing would come, your restoration would come. Lord, for those that, like Lori, that are dealing with the after effects of it, I pray for healing and deliverance of those after effects, God. And I believe, Lord Jesus, for, for our family and friends that are, that are dealing with it in their bodies right now that are sick today, for healing, blessing, and deliverance, Lord God. And Father, for these hospitals, these doctors, these nurses that are working long hours under these stressful conditions, these heroes, Lord God, on the front lines, that you'll bless them, encourage them, lift them up, and speak life, peace, and strength to, their, to them, body, mind, and spirit today. And Lord, that this pandemic will be Come to an end. Come to an end today, Lord God. May we look back on this day and know that you have fulfilled this promise of, of blessing and good for your, for your church and for your people, God, and that you will answer as we have called upon you today. I love you, Father. I believe for great and mighty things through your Holy Spirit this morning and ask you to touch every heart, every life, every body and mind in this room and those, Lord God, that are with us online and those, Lord God, that will be seeing this by DVD later, that you today, Lord God, will be Lord of all and that your blessings will be obvious and realized and recognized in our hearts and lives this morning. And we'll be careful to praise you, honor you, and give you the glory for it all today. In Jesus' name, everybody said,
Amen. Let's worship him for a little while longer this morning. God gave you. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise the Lamb. He's worthy. Talking about the worthiness of God this morning. God, let our praise be sweet to your ears today. Thank you for the cross. Thank you for the price you paid. Bearing all my sins love you came and gave amazing grace. Thank you for this love, Lord. Thank you for the name of Wash me in your cleansing flow. How
touch today like I've never known a fresh touch a fresh anointing that father God whoever hears my voice Lord would understand that it's coming from you and not from me have your way God in this place speak to us Lord today through your Holy Spirit use God your children to do what you have given us the gifts to do and the blessings to do in Jesus name hallelujah praise God you can be seated kids church Carly Church, as it's been reframed, we have to make t-shirts or something. What a great blessing, thank God, this morning, for you and for being in this house together today. I know God's got good stuff going on. Praise the Lord. Go, Jaybird. Bye, Jaybird. <laughs> I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth. If that's how I'm striving to live my day, there ain't a whole lot of time and place for other stuff to be in my mouth. Folks, we've got a, we've got a short time. I really believe time is getting short. The signs of the times, all the stuff going on in this world, we've got to be ready. We've got to make up our minds that we're going to live the way we ought to live and do what we ought to do. Not by culture, not by world, not by the way this world functions and operates, but by the Word of God. And I know that's not popular. I know that's not something a lot of people strive for. But I'm telling you, if Calvary Temple Assembly of God in High Wealth of Kansas will be known as a praying church, as a church of the Word, they can't help themselves. They will. They will come to know him as your Lord and Savior. It'll make a difference in your individual personal life, and it'll make a difference in this world. And I'm telling you, God is up to something good, and uh, I'm, I'll just tell you, I don't know if you can see a difference in me or not. I don't know if you can. I know it's there because, well, I'm living it, but as your pastor and as someone who loves and cares for you and has the privilege of being your shepherd, uh, as it were, as a pastor, I'm telling you, God is doing something. He's done it in me, and I believe he's doing what he's doing in me so that I can give you what he's given me to encourage you and help you. And I'm telling you, God is, he, he's, it's incredible. And it's, it's, it's not just one thing, it's a hundred things. And it's just, it's miraculous, it's phenomenal. What I, what I know God is doing in me, and what I trust he's doing in you, and will do in you, as you, as you seek him, as you trust him, and as you know for a fact that he is who the word says he is, and that what that Bible says is true, 100% from Genesis to maps and everything in there is yours and everything in there you you can claim those promises and live those promises and experience these things and have what the word of God says we can have and do what the word of God says we can do. There's too many people I'm afraid that are living their lives as if this is an old book. This is old Bible. This is back then and that God doesn't do those things anymore. You can't prove that. 
I can prove you otherwise because I have seen the dead raised. I've seen people healed and miraculously touched. I've seen God do incredible things, but I've not seen enough of it. I've seen God do incredible things, but we've still got people in this room right now that need a miracle in their body, in their mind, in their spirit, in their finances, and I'm believing God to do all of that and to continue to do that day in and day out. I want to get to the place where the miracle is the norm rather than the exception. I want to get to the place where God is doing what the Word of God says He does every day, and we're not shocked by it anymore. I want to see God do what God does best, and that's just love us in whatever way, whatever manifestation that takes place. And I'm, I'm excited about what God has in store for Calvary Temple and for Hiawatha and Northeast Kansas and the world, essentially, because of what he's doing in us. The Armor of God. This is part five of this part of the series. It's really a continuation of living in victory. Uh, if you don't get down to the truth of it. But we're going to talk today about the breastplate of righteousness. Now, the breastplate of righteousness is a piece of equipment that you look at and... and, and when you see these pictures of like these old Roman soldiers, you may see them in a movie. Maybe you see a picture, an artist's depiction, or what have you. There's some things about this breastplate that are really significant. For one, for one thing, they're very ornate, very beautiful, very, you know, they, they'll shine, and, and you know, they, they polish them, they shine them up, they do all this stuff to them, uh, did all that stuff to them. And, of course, now in the modern day, it's, it's just decoration of the primarily because nobody wears anything like what they wore 2,000 years ago. But we're not talking about specifically what they wore. We're talking about what we have at our disposal. We have the whole armor of God. Ephesians chapter number 6, starting in verse number 10. And Paul records these words out of his experience, what he witnessed uh, sitting next to one of these soldiers, chained next to one of these soldiers for a number of years. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but principalities and against powers and against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to meet. All right, let's try that again. That you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand. To stand, therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith with which you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for the saints. God, the same word that you anointed when it was written, anoint me to speak and preach and teach right now in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week we talked about the belt of truth, and we talked about how that belt was really one of the most integral parts of the armor that you never really talk about. If you were a Roman soldier, your belt was just a belt. This belt I have on here is just a belt. Now this belt serves a good purpose for me, it holds my britches up. And you know, in, in this day and age, that's a very wonderful thing, because occasionally, if you watch a little bit of uh, Funny Stone videos, there are people that have, uh, that have been on national television because, well, they didn't have a belt. And uh, so I'm, I don't want to be that, and we're videoing this, you know, as we do every week, and we're live online right now, and, and uh, that's not a claim to fame we want. We don't want to be on the news because of something like that. But this belt is important to me this morning. Now, we used to joke around back when it was, back when it was popular to wear suspenders. Uh, well, I had one, one buddy of mine that uh, he was getting ready to preach one Sunday, and he had on a suspenders and a belt. Well, that's just the ultimate man of insecurity right there. He's, he, he's making he's double, double covering everything, making sure that, that's your fail safe, I guess, but, but uh, you know, and, and, and all those kind of silly things. But that belt, as we talked about last week, just to remind you, I'm going to do this each week. I don't want to take a lot of time, because the time I get down to the, the, the helmet and the, the sword and stuff, we're going to be spending 30 minutes re, re, rehashing, I don't want to do that, so I'm going to be careful to not do that. But that belt held everything together. And the breastplate we're going to talk about today, I'll go ahead and describe it, and then we'll talk about the belt in relation to that. So this breastplate would have come down, and it's a two-piece, well, more than two-piece probably, but it, but it definitely had the two pieces. It had the part that covered the front, and it was molded and shaped. It looked like a big old strong man's chest, and, and it had to be because when you get down to it, all of this equipment, all of these pieces of armor, when you have the, the breastplate, the belt, the thing, the, the, your shoes, and your, your greaves, which would cover your shin, shin guards, and you've got your sword, and you've got your shield, and you've got uh, your helmet, all of that stuff together could weigh up to 100 pounds. 
little skinny folks wasn't carrying that around. You had to be a dude to carry that stuff around. And you had to be, you had to be a buff dude to carry that stuff around. So it, was, it, was not just, it, it wasn't just for the average person. These people were trained and equipped and enabled and knew how to use those pieces of, of equipment. And, and a Roman soldier knew that his life depended on his equipment and his armor and his protection. And here's the beautiful thing. When you use this illustration, I'm going to throw this in a lot, those around him. Because you're only as good as the guy to your right and your left. You're only as good as the next person that is going to help protect your back because if the enemy comes at you from, from an angle you don't see, you've got your brother on the, on the side and sisters, in our case here in the church, ready to fight for you and help you, right? So you have that. So you have this, this beautiful ornate uh, silver, maybe gold, maybe bronze, different, different materials they used. Some of that might have been depending on if you were the higher up guys, you might have something gold or, or, or silver, but bronze was, was the primary material as well. Very strong, very durable. It could, take a, it could take a shot off of a sword or a spear or an arrow even, and in some cases if it's made right. But you had hinges on the top of some sort, usually brass rings of some kind, that, that held it together. And you had it come down the back to cover you, probably covered you, well, all the way down. And, you know, anyway, it doesn't matter. I, there's something funny that come to my brain, probably come to yours too. But you were covered, all right, from the back and the front. So, so now then, but now also it come to you about here, but it probably had like upper leg guards that come down that were probably hinged. So when you moved or walked, it, it didn't, didn't hold you back. But, so, what did we have? We had our belt of truth. And what's our belt of truth? One of the primary purposes, it holds our breastplate in place. It holds it down. Otherwise, you're running into battle and it's all flopping and everything's going every direction. So you're, it holds you down. It's got a place for your sword. It's got a place for your shield. It's got a place for you know, equipment. And it's holding everything together. So your truth, your truth keeps your righteousness in place, which we're going to talk about in detail in a minute. Your, tr your truth has a place for your, your sword of the Spirit. Your truth has a place for your shield of faith. Your truth brings it all and holds it all together. And like I said, most people aren't really looking at the belt and saying, oh, wow, that's a nice belt. They don't think about it. It's just a part of your, it's just a part of your stuff. And it's just, it, is what, it is what it is. But that belt of truth, on the other hand, holds it all together, brings it all together, and makes sure everything is where it belongs. Because without the truth, there is no righteousness. Without the truth, there is no faith. Without the truth, there is no salvation. Without the truth, there is no gospel. Because all of those things equal truth. So we have the truth of God's word that holds it all together and brings it all together. And we can't pray. As he said, praying with all prayer and supplication. None of that's going to happen without our truth. And without that being in place. So today we're talking about this breastplate of righteousness. Now go back again to the natural illustration that Paul gives us here of this Roman soldier who he was chained to for about the last, well, parts of his life, but definitely about the last five, ten years, maybe a little longer, in Rome. And he is, while he's writing Ephesus and while he's writing several other the prison epistles, he is chained to this guy every day. And I'm sure they rotated him and, and just probably give him a break because Paul kept getting them saved and they had to get a new one, had to get a new heathen guard in because he's going to get the next one saved. I'll be curious when we get to heaven to know how many of those Roman soldiers that Paul had captive see paul was in chains but he had captives and how many of those people he won to jesus and I, I think there's got to be bunches of them i really do and they, and I, I can't imagine where they'd say well did you accept G uh, paul's jesus today yeah i did well next who wants to go in next can you and i think they'd interview him can you withstand this guy's attacks on you can you understand that that nero or, or whichever emperor is your god and you don't have you don't need any other god can you understand that and lo and behold, after how many, how many days they come out, well, I asked Jesus in my life, smiling, I asked Jesus in my life, all right, next, next, get out of here. No, so how many of them Paul reached? I, I really think there's a lot of them. I mean, like I said, we'll find out when we get to heaven. But, but you have this soldier, and there he sits, day after day, with his big pretty helmet, probably sitting on the table because he's in the room, don't need it. And he's got his big helmet, he's got his breastplate, he's got his belt, he's got his, his shin guards, and, and which is the... the part of the shoes of the preparation of the gospel of peace which go all the way down and cover his feet as well and you had those shoes which we'll talk about when we get to that he's got his sword he's got his spear which will be a lance which is the lance of prayer we'll talk about that later that's a rick renner uh, interpretation on that that we're going to talk about when we get to prayer and he's got his shield i almost left that shield out so he's a, this big old shield he's got all this stuff together and paul looks at this and the holy spirit begins to work on him like we talked about a number of weeks ago and says hey paul Look at that shield. Don't you imagine that's like your faith? 
strong and powerful and movable and, and you can use it as an offensive and a defensive weapon. Look at that spear. That's your prayer life. Look at that sword. There's the word that actually comes in and divides even the joint uh, or the, 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 to the joint of the soul and the spirit. Don't you, don't you imagine that you have that all, I mean, he's just giving them all this stuff and Paul's like doing writing down stuff. And here we have our word. And remember, this church at Ephesus, this is the first, che- first church Jesus corrects in Revelation, which we talked about in detail a number of months ago. And you have all these things we talked about a few weeks ago and leading up to getting to the actual armor, where we talked about how this church, they had problems. They were struggling with lying and doing, and, you know, there was, there's a list of stuff in chapter 4, I believe it was, that, that, uh, that Paul says, listen, you guys got to figure this out because you're just not, you're not doing things the right way. So what do we have today? We have the breastplate spiritual here, the breast righteousness. Now righteousness is the least complicated, most complicated aspect of Christian life there is. I know what I just said. I said that well on purpose. Righteousness is easy to to complicate. How? Because when I decide that it's my, my abilities, my stuff, and my anything except my faith that brings that righteousness, my faith in Jesus, I have a problem. My right doing is not, in my own power and strength and ability, not necessarily righteousness. I'm going to say it again. I want to be clear. You should do right. You should act right. Walk. Right, walk right and spit white, as a, a preacher friend of mine used to say. That should be the way you live your life. But why are you living that life? Why are you doing what you're doing and not doing what you're not doing? The world and much of the church world is scoring points. We're getting merits. We're getting points with God because I did, I could have, I could have, but I didn't. I almost did, but I stopped. God sure must be proud of me. I bet he loves me more now because I didn't than he did before I thought about doing. That's the way the world thinks. Because that's how we function amongst ourselves. Ladies, have you ever, you can fill in the blank here later on in your own time, but I wish he would stop. Whatever, fill in the blank. Leaving his socks on the floor or his unmentionables, because I'm not going to mention them, on the floor or leaving a mess, why can't he do dishes, why can't he put stuff in the dishwasher, I better stop, I'm, I'm, about to, I'm stirring up trouble, I got people back here grinning and looking at their, at their husbands, you know, I'm, 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 calling, I'm meddling now, I'm not preaching anymore, I, just, I, I stopped preaching and started meddling right there, but no, I mean, but there, there are things, that, and it's like, now over time, now here's the problem, What's, what did Jesus, Jesus said the little foxes spoil the vines, right, what does that mean? And I'll tell you this because I've, I've heard people talk about it. I've read, I've read articles and stuff about it too. When people go to divorce court, when a couple gets to the place where they can't live together in the same house any longer, most of the time it's not some big, massive, horrible, unfaithful, cheating thing or whatever. It is this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing and this thing. Finally, her cup runneth over and she's like, I'm done. Or he. It works both ways. Or just, I'm just, I've had it. Well, what did he do wrong? I don't know, I don't know how to say it. Well, yeah, you do. It was socks, it was shoes, it was this, it was that. It was unthinking, uncaring, forgot a birthday, forgot an anniversary, forgot another anniversary, forgot another anniversary, forgot another, and I mean, all this, all this piles up, and pretty soon it's like, I can't stand this anymore. And you start asking, well, what was it? And you think, well, it's a birthday. You remind him, and you score points out of that. And you get free dinners for, you get, you get dates for two weeks because, they forgot, and you can hammer that. You can milk that cow dry. Come on, somebody. Am I the only one? We don't. We just don't. We've, I've always been good at that. I've never had one, never had one slip up on me. Uh, God gave us a daughter uh, for our third anniversary and then granted us those grandchildren as a result of that, of that wonderfulness. But, but, I mean, in all seriousness, that we, I, that's not a problem for me. My wife's never had to tell me, oh, my birthday's coming up. Usually it's me saying, hey, your birthday's coming up. Where are we eating? Come on now. Hallelujah. And, um, you know, you, you priorities. But, but you know, you, but, uh, I mean, that's, that's the kind of stuff that's just, that's a function. But I know from talking to other husbands, 
and other situations. And they're just kind of like down. They're like, oh, man, what's wrong? I forgot my wife's birthday. What are you going to do? I'm not done counting yet. I don't know what this is going to cost me because it's going to cost me dinners. It's going to cost me movies. It's going to cost me jewelry. Oh, when that's going to stop, I mean, because you're in the dog house. And, you know, the dog's like, no, nah, you ain't coming in here. I mean, it's that bad. He said, you, you messed up so bad, you can't even come in my house. I mean, that's how bad it is. And, you know, but, but it's little stuff. Very few couples run into the place where it's like, I'm finished, I'm done, it's over because of some major thing. It's a lot of little things. I mean, you think about some of y'all in your jobs and stuff, too. I mean, like, you know, if you ever had a job that you, you really liked for a while and then something changed. Bosses change, tasks change, management change, something happened, and you're like, I hate this now. And I'm going to tell you, life's too short to have a job you hate. I'll say it again. I'll say it to anybody that wants to listen. Life is too short to have a job you hate. I've had one or two of those in my life, but I didn't stay there long. And it, and it has to do with lots of reasons, lots of things. But even at that, if you hate your job, you can still be a happy person because you got Jesus and God gave you that job. And I wish God would give a few more people jobs. We were, we, well, like I said, we was in Branson this last week, and we went at dinner time to go to restaurants on a Monday night, Tuesday night. On a Tuesday night, hour and a half wait, two and a half hour wait. There's tables open everywhere. They don't have help. Now, we know why, and I'm not, I'm not going to get political on that. We know that people can make more money sitting at the house right now than they can until they cut that off than they can working. I get it, especially if you've got kids. If you've got kids, stay home with them. You ain't paying a babysitter, and you're still making more money than you made the other way. I understand that. And we live in a world where our government makes it easier to do something a little different than what, you, than, than what I wish people would do, not just selfishly so I can go have dinner. I don't mean that. But there's a lot of jobs that need to be filled, and a lot of people that can fill them that just won't because they don't have to. And I think that's, I, I think that's an issue, and I, think it's, I wish it's something we didn't have to think about. But... And, you know, our inconvenience is no big deal. I don't care about that. We wound up with barbecue places really better than what we'd had anyway. So thank you, Jesus. But, but, but in, in all, all candor here, I'm telling you, when you start talking about what's right and what's wrong, now, I hadn't lost where I'm at. All that was part of my point. Righteousness. Righteousness has one source. One source. And without faith in Jesus Christ, there is no righteousness. Because I'm going to show you about four passages of Scripture here that spell this out for us very plainly. The first of those is Romans chapter 1, 16 and 17. Now the first part of this you know well because it's one we talk about a lot. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes, for the Jew first and also for the Greek. Watch this. For in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith as it is written the just shall live by faith. Now, let's stop there just for a minute and think about the righteousness of God. This is not my ability. This is not what I can do in and of myself without help. The righteousness of God is assisted by God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, and gives me what I need to show this world there is righteousness that is not self-righteous, that is not scoring points for myself and trying to build me up so that God will love me more as the religious mentality is righteousness from God or of God is a life that is lived in the word it's a life that is lived of the word It's a life that fulfills the word of God and that we are functioning in the way we function because of what God is doing and not for any other reason now there's a difference I know people I've been this person I'll, I'll be honest enough to tell you that I've done stuff before thinking well if I do this that's a good and wonderful thing I'll, I'll, I'll be proud of myself but there's lots of things that I've done in my life that I know God has shown me, directed me, helped me understand. And without faith, I do not have righteousness. Without faith in Jesus Christ, there is no righteousness that has any form or function except for making us feel good, making us proud of ourselves, or making us think we've done good, or we've, we, we've stepped up and, and done something. Listen, feeling good's wonderful. When you do something for somebody, it is fantastic. And y'all are, are so good to us and have been so good to us over these seven and a half years and I'm so thankful for all the ways that you show love to us and care for us and do things that you do for us. And I, and I know that you do that for the right reasons because you love your pastor. Don't have any question about that whatsoever. But if you do anything for anybody thinking, well, God's sure going to be proud of me. God's sure going to love me for this. You hear me say it all the time, and I have to throw it here. God can't love you more and won't love you less. 
There's a song, I can't even think of the whole song. I, I just heard it on the radio and it stuck out in my mind like yesterday when I was, I was going back home from, from a couple errands I was running and getting stuff ready for today that I've never been more loved than I am right now. I love that. I'm gonna, that's going to have to work in with my, with my can't love me more than what we less. I've never been more loved than I am right now. God has never loved me more than he does right now. And he never will love me more than he does love me right now because his love is perfect. His love is incredible. And it's that love that motivates me to action. It's not so I will be loved. It's because I am loved. What's the difference? A huge difference. I can't score enough points to say God that, that God will love me or love me more. It doesn't work that way. The world works that way, and we've applied that to God because I've talked to so many people in my lifetime. I was one of them, honestly. I've messed up so bad, I just don't know how God can truly bless me or love me or save me. Well, that's a terrible thing to hear, I can tell you. I've had it said to me many times. Yeah, but I was so bad and I was so dark and I had so much sin. I, I was just doing so many wrong things and I didn't care what God thought. I even told God one time I didn't even believe he existed. Can I give you good news today? Neither height, nor depth, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor any other created thing shall separate us from the love of God. That's every human being. Every human being. Let's be clear. Every human being. But, until I come to a saving knowledge of, Jesus, of, of God through Jesus Christ, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I am lost. Hell will be full of people God loves. It will grieve his heart. But hell will be full of people God loves because God loves every one of them. Every one of them. There is no person that's ever been born that God didn't love. None. Period. They don't exist. It's a myth to think that, that, that God hates a person. God hates a person's sin. I can give you scripture after scripture that verifies that. Righteousness is of God. And the world's idea of doing righteous things is so God will love us, so God will approve of us, God will accept us. That's religion. Relationship is, I do what I do because we're in this relationship. And like I said a while ago, I make mistakes. There are occasionally socks left in the floor. But when we were young married folks, really before we were living for Jesus even, if I left my socks out in the floor, I heard the grumble, the mumble, and I heard the huh, and huh, oh, socks again. What's wrong with him? What is it? Why can't he just pick up his socks? There was a time or two, sitting next to her or near her, I'd come in from work or come in from whatever, sit down on that seat, pull my socks and shoes off, and just drop them in the floor, and hear heavy sigh. Her and her mind thinking, I'm fixing to have to pick those up whenever he don't. And I even learned, and I still do it today. It happens about two weeks ago. I can probably think of it, I, I can tell you the day and what was on TV. As I dropped them, before they hit the floor, I said, I will get these when I go to the bedroom. I'd been mowing, I was hot, and I was tired. I was just like, I will not leave these in this floor. Are we clear? Do we understand that I am going to do this? And I've had a time or two. She just said, occasionally you still do, just so those that are watching online understand everything that's been said and done in the house of the Lord this morning. And occasionally I have gotten around the corner. I don't know how the house is laid out. Almost everybody here has been in our house. And I get around the corner like, oh. And I look at her and smile and pick them up and take them with me. It's socks, man. They're not heavy. Well, they're heavy smelling. I got new shoes, so they're not too bad right now. But it's, it's the little things. And she's not going to divorce me over not picking my socks up. I'm not that silly. But why don't I sow good seeds in good soil instead of letting little things get in there? Littlest thing I ever had, and you've had some of them too, is a splinter. Little bitty sliver of wood, I mean, no bigger than nothing. Sometimes it's not even, you can't, sometimes you can't even see it. You know it's still there because you feel it, but you can't even see the thing. But that little bitty piece of something that don't belong will start to fester. It'll get disgusting and nasty. 
It will stink, even in some cases, and it can affect the entire body. There are people that have died with a blood infection they got from some little old something they got under their skin. Happens all the time. When I was helping my sister after Craig passed away, I torn on the back of my wrist. I still got a scar. A month, I was cutting stuff off of a thorn tree because it was in the, where they needed, to, needed it not to be. And I bumped it. And I, got a, I pulled a pretty good piece out and thought I had it, but then after a little while I went, no, I didn't get it. Nearly six weeks later, over a month for sure, it got to hurting, and I got to fiddling with it, and I got to realize, oh, my goodness. And I, and I just kind of squeezed on the spot, and a piece about a quarter inch literally shot out of my arm. Within a day, the soreness was gone. Within two days, the redness was gone. But that little bitty thing, it's little. It's not, no big deal. I mean, you could you cut off a piece of fingernail that's bigger than that when you clip your nails. I mean, how can that be? Because so much of the time, something little and seemingly insignificant has the ability to wreck a whole life. Righteousness is that gift from God that moves us to action, moves us to compassion, moves us in ways that we will do things in the name of Jesus, if you will, for the totally right reason, that is, that we, as we do those things, it's as if we are doing them for God. I may get two parts out of this one, we'll have to see. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 1. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. No, that's not right. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Let's go there first. I stand corrected of myself. 2 Corinthians chapter number 5, starting at verse number 20. Paul writes this to the Corinthian church in his second letter. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. In verse 21, he says, He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Now, I'm going to leave that up on the screen for just a second because I, I, I want us to think about this and even see this, just see this with, with what we're looking at here. The righteousness of God. I've got it in bold, at least here in the room. I couldn't figure out how to do that on the, the online feed, but it's on there, but it's not bold and, 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 and big print right like this is. Righteousness of God. That we, might, that we might become the righteousness of God. I want to submit to you this morning in this way, if I can say it the way I want to say it and, and articulate this like I want to. There is a difference between doing righteous things and being righteous. Righteous things or what we do because we have that relationship with God and we feel like he's directing us, helping us, and speaking to our hearts in the compassion and the love for others that we do things we do. But righteousness should be who we are as Christians. It should be a part of our lifestyle. It should be a part of our choices every day. And it's not what we're doing for attention. It's not what we're doing to stand out. It's what we're doing because we do what it is that God himself would do. We help the way God would help. We speak the way God would speak. We are godly people doing godly things in a godly way that equals the righteousness of God. And if we're not careful, because humanity does this, we get egotistical. We start thinking how good we are and how wonderful we are and how sweet we are and how precious we are. And pretty soon it's, it's, it becomes about us. It's kind of like servanthood. I've heard this said, and it, boy, it speaks clear. And As a, as a, a youth pastor, I was also slash associate pastor and I and I still have the same mentality as a pastor it's hard for me sometimes to separate myself from it but as a youth pastor and associate pastor I had one job anything and everything I could do to make my pastor's life better and easier that was my job that's all I that's all I focused on something needed to be done I went and did it he didn't have to tell me to do it he didn't have to ask me to do it it's really kind of it's really kind of funny for a few years really about two years We'd have a staff meeting. We'd be talking. He said, "We need to get this. We need to get the tables and chairs set up. The ladies are having something, or they're, we're having fellowship, or whatever's going on." And I'd say, well, "I already did it because I had. I knew it needed to be done, so I did it. Just the way I function. If I knew something was coming, I did it before he had a chance to tell me. Well, let's go see. Let's go look at it. 
I told him about this after I left. After we were having lunch one day, and I told him this stuff, and he really thought it was funny. But so we'd go down the hall to the other building, and we'd look at it. Well, it looks good. Good job, Jim. Okay. Well, I learned after a little while, he would tell me to do something that I'd already done. I learned a wonderful phrase. I will. If I said I will, that's good enough. It'll get done. I already done it. But if I said I already did it, well, we got to look it over. We got to make sure it's right. If I said I will, eventually he'll walk through that building and be out doing something, and he'll see that it was done. And I told him after I left him, and of course, one day, and this again, this is just uh, I don't, well, I don't sound right, but it, it's going. I have to say it now because I've already put it out there. One day after we left, we were having lunch, the same conversation, and he started the conversation off with. Jim, I miss you. I said, do you? He said, yeah. He said, I didn't realize all the stuff you were doing that, I that now I have to think about and, and make sure it gets done. And he had two, he had two staff people then, actually three, three staff people by then, doing the stuff that I had done by myself for a while, and then later we had that extra staff. But, but, uh, but you know, it's, it's, why was I doing that? Because I, I, I learned servanthood early on. And it's a very important thing. As a pastor, I still have that servant's heart. I hope I show that. I hope I manifest that because I think it's one of the great qualities of a Christian. But an elder, an elder uh, pastor one time said this, and he said, boys, this, I'm going to tell you about servanthood. Servanthood is, is doing what you do and taking care of business for the kingdom for anybody, whoever you can. But he said the true test of a servant's heart is how you feel when you're treated like one. The man, he said that, and I'm sitting there like, I've been serving it a few times. I've been treated like a servant, like somebody that's beneath them. I've had, as a matter of fact, I, I could name a couple names. Not here, they don't live here. From Arkansas, that just has this, they have, they're, they're up here and we're all down here. And it, it was my privilege to get to help them and do what I did for them, whatever it was. And when he said that, the true test of a servant's heart is how you respond or how you feel when you're treated like one. I'm like, wow, that's, that's huge. I mean, that's a big deal. Because I've known some people that had that little entitlement about them that was like, who does he think he is telling me what to do? I get to do what I do. I get to help. I get to do what I can do for the kingdom. And regardless of how anybody else treats me or how they feel about what I'm doing, I should do it because it's the right thing to do. That is righteousness, I think, lived in the flesh. I think it helps, and I think it makes a difference. Now then, let's, i got a couple more passages here we're going to look at real quick, and then uh, we'll go enjoy some good lunch today. But, but I want you to think about this righteousness. Again, this is, this is the covering of your, of your torso. This covers your body, and, and it covers your heart, covers your, your life, and it gives you protection, and also def- it gives you defense. I think it also gives offense. Can you imagine that shiny, those shiny, guy, those shiny breastplates lined up on a, on a sunshiny day and you're about to face this army and you can't even hardly see them because of the shine off of that, off of that breastplate because that would have been a factor as well. Righteousness shines. I, like the, I, love, that, I love that idea. So 1 Corinthians chapter 1. I, 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 I alluded to that a minute ago. Now we're going there. 1 Corinthians chapter number 1 starting at verse number 26. There's a lot of good right here. and This may be where I finish up today. We'll see. We'll see how this plays out. For you see your calling, brethren, that not many wise according to the flesh, and not many mighty, not many noble are called. But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to put shame to the wise. And God has chosen the weak things of the world to put shame to the things which are mighty. Can I get a witness anywhere? I've, I've lived a lot of that. And the base things of the world and the things which are despised, God has chosen, and the things which are not, to bring to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now, I could, I could have singled out a couple of verses here, but I, when I got to reading this, I'm like, I can't do that, because this, this all matters. Because he brings to nothing the things that are, that no flesh should glory in his presence. Now, here's the key. Here's the important aspect of this that goes on in these last, this last verse and a half, or last couple of verses. But of him you are in Christ, who became for us wisdom from God, and he became righteousness and sanctification, and redemption that as it is written he who glories let him glory in the Lord I don't know if you've ever paid attention to some of these TV preachers which I don't have one right now that I care much about 
I like Rick Renner. I don't consider him a TV preacher. There's a difference between him and most of these others. I won't name names. I won't pick them out because I'd pick on somebody that, that you might really enjoy listening to, and that's, I, that's not what I'm here to do. I, I have no problem with other voices speaking to your heart as long as they're scriptural and as long as they're back, back in truth. I'm good with that. I think it's wonderful, and I'm proud for you. But there is nobody on television right now that I feel like I could watch and get something out of. Um, and I say on television. Rick Renner is on one of our channels on our satellite, but I watch, when I watch his stuff, I watch it on YouTube because it's just as easy. But, but I'm, I'm just telling you something here, that you better be sure that the voices that have your heart and your attention are the voices that are anointed of, of, of God, the same, the same author of this scripture you have in your lap. But he says here, this is Christ Jesus who became for us, who became for us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. The transformation of your life and mine is rooted in the righteousness, sanctification, and redemption of God. And as he says there, he said just before that, no flesh should glory in his presence, and he finishes with, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. I've heard a few. Again, I'm not going to name names. I don't want to hurt somebody's feelings. I have listened to a few preachers, and if I've ever come across this way, please forgive me. And if you can name the time, I will apologize specifics for whatever it is. But if I've ever come across as more important than the word I'm giving you or more important than the message of the gospel or what have you or that it's me that's so fantastic about all this, please forgive me. I've heard some preachers preach before that they were doing us a favor by letting us be in their presence and hear their voice. That it was our privilege to listen to them talk and pontificate about all their greatness and about Jesus. See what, hear what, see what I did there? I am nothing without the righteousness of Christ. I am worthless. I am flesh and bones, and because of my size, I'm probably uh, worth a couple of cents more. But if you break down all, the, all the, the vitamins and minerals and the blood and all the stuff in my body, last time I checked, and the, and the value may have gone up because of inflation, unfortunately, under the current atmosphere we're in, that my body and all the chemicals and things that make up my body is worth about nine dollars and 42 cents maybe nine maybe ten dollars because you know uh, there's more of me than there is some of you so my value I'm, I'm i'm worth more to you when it comes when it comes down to selling me off but i'm not worth anything because i am flesh and blood I'm, I'm a dirt body with a spirit that god loves and cares for and he has given me life and life abundant he's given me a hope and he's given me righteousness he's given me truth and joy and all these things that I have, and without him, none of that matters. Because without him, I have nothing. I am nothing. I will never be anything without Jesus Christ. The way the world thinks, maybe. The way, uh, way folks think, my wife loves me and cares for me, and she is good to me, and my grandkids think I'm great. James is going to tell you right now that Pawpaw's just the greatest ever. That, I, that he, He's Pawpaw's boy, aren't you? And he loves his Pawpaw. And uh, he even got his mama's goat the other day. For the first time, I think he's ever said this, that he actually, she said, who do you love? And he said, I love my papa. Usually the answer on that was my mama. Well, papa moved up in the ranks, and, and I'm, I'm, I'll get a little prideful if I don't watch out here, but, but it, that's just a me and him thing. And, I, and that, that value he holds of me is, is no different than, than anything else. I, I like it, and uh, he's my buddy, but we're, you know, that, that's, that's the way we think. But if anything or anything in this world ever comes to that, rises to that level where it's more important to me than what God sees, what God thinks, how God wants me to have life I've made a terrible mistake and I close in Romans chapter number 3 and verse 21 and here's what Paul this, this, this is loaded get ready this is loaded you see it on the screen you see the kind of the gray outline with the, with the gray underline and outline but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is being revealed uh, being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of God, oops, I missed that one, I didn't get that one highlighted, of God through faith in Jesus Christ to all and on all, all who believe, there is no difference. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Jesus Christ, whom God sent forth as a propitiation or substitute by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance God had passed over the sins that were previously committed. In verse 26, he goes on to finish, to demonstrate at the present time his righteousness, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. 
There is nothing I can do of my own ability. There is nothing I can do except believe in Jesus. That is the only thing I must do is to believe in Jesus. Because with Jesus comes righteousness, sanctification, redemption. Comes love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. With Jesus comes all that comes under that umbrella. And without Jesus, none of that works. None of that is possible. None of that has, has any function in this world. Only in Jesus Christ can righteousness be righteousness. There is no other way. And if my righteousness is that righteousness of God in Christ through faith, with the help of the Holy Spirit, I should not fail. I almost said I cannot fail. Not true. These liars that get up and tell you, if you'll just come to Jesus, your life will just be so perfect and beautiful. You ever notice that most of those people say stuff like that? Say God with two syllables. Glory to God, duh. Once in a while, I'll get fired up and I'll preach and have, have some, some stuff like that and have a little, uh, at, the end of my, at the end of a word. My wife looks at me because she doesn't approve of that kind of behavior. Once or twice, I've heard some old-timey preachers that preach like that. Act it. And I... When you really get to going, uh, you really get that little, uh, and people are wondering, why is he coughing after every other word? What's wrong with this guy? You know, let's get him healed. Let's get some praying going on there. Let's get him a prayer line, anoint him with oil, prayer, praise. Get that out of there. But I do kind of get amused when I hear one of those, one of those puffed up gas bags get up there talking about glory to God. Duh. It's just God. It's just simple. I don't know if you've noticed it, but my prayers have got a little more simple. I used to be one of these get up and, and pray preacher prayers. Oh, most holy, glorious, omnipotent, wonderful Father, we, we, we beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the glory. And it's like, just once in a while, I just wonder if God's like, can you come on? Just, just what, are you, what, are you, what are you after? What do you need? Don't give me all this stuff. Just come to me. What a friend we have in Jesus. Those churches ain't singing that song. Because they don't come to Jesus as a friend. They come to Jesus with all this high and mighty talking stuff. You get in trouble? Okay, just checking. Sorry, my granddaughter is walking, in, walking back in from kids' church. I thought she got in trouble. She doesn't get in trouble, so that's not a problem. And when, see, when Jameson comes back in, it's like, of course he's back, naturally. But, uh, but, but in conclusion this morning, I, 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 sorry I spun off there for a second, I'm back. When you look at the righteousness that we're talking about, we're talking about a righteousness that is a covering. And, it, it, and again, it becomes who we are, and it's just, it, it's, there's no automatic. Let's be clear, there's no automatic righteousness. It is intentional, it's on purpose, it is thoughtful, it is I do what I do because it's what I should do, what I've learned from the word that I should do. And I've heard people say stuff like, if you'll, I like, I like this one, and, and, I, and I agree with most everything else this author has ever written, and I think he was quoting somebody else anyway. If you'll keep doing what's right, eventually what's wrong will leave your life. Now stop and think about that. If you keep doing what's right, eventually what's wrong will leave your life after the great white throne judgment. The more right you do, the madder the devil is and the more he's going to try to confuse you, get you off track and take you, off, take you offline. He only has the power you give him. But until you stand before God and he says, well done my good and faithful servant, the possibilities are endless of the fact that you could stump your toe and fall flat on your face and need to get right again and again and again and again. I've lived it. And I challenge you today, church. Yes, we do what's right. Yes, we live the way the Word says live. We do the things the Word of God says we do. But we never drop our guard. We continue to put on our armor. We continually are ready to fight the fight of faith and be who we are in Christ. Because the moment we let down is the moment that a whole army of demons are going to try to run over the top of us. The moment we let down is the moment we're going to say or do or function in a way that is ungodly, unholy, and unchristlike. So we have our armor. We have our belt of truth. We have our breastplate of righteousness. We have our helmet of salvation. We have our sword of the spirit. We have our shield of faith. And we have everything that we need 
that God has equipped us with. But if we don't use it, if we don't apply it to our lives, it is worthless. I have a couple of folks that serve in the military. And over the course of time, our military has gotten better and stronger and more technology and more this and more that. But if that soldier doesn't wear that helmet, he is wide open to an attack from an enemy that can do harm. If that soldier doesn't have on certain pieces of that equipment that the United States Army, Air Force, Marines, or Coast Guard has provided them, they may not survive the next event. But with those things, and with the training and the understanding and the knowledge of what those things can do, we have the best fighting force on the planet, the United States military. Because they're equipped. They're enabled. They're trained. And as a pastor, my job is like those sergeants and those other training officers in a manner of speaking in conclusion today God's given you everything you need the US government has provided our military men and women what they need but without training without understanding without the importance of how those things work and how they function how they protect and how they attack it's just stuff I'm going to be careful here there's a big push right now for gun control because crime is out of control across this country. But I'm going to tell you something right now. There's not a single gun that anybody owns that's ever shot somebody by itself. It's the evil of the human heart that takes them to shoot people. Can I tell you that there's places in the world that guns are illegal and that the, a person can have a gun? You know what they use? A knife, a hatchet, a stick, a pipe, their fist, a rock. Cain and Abel didn't have guns. But he got the job done. I'm telling you, it's the human heart that's the problem. And yet we go, we go into all this, and what I'm telling you is you want to protect your heart, get your breastplate of righteousness, get your shield of faith, get your sword of the Spirit, get your helmet of salvation on to guard your heart and mind. If you want to have what you're supposed to have in Jesus Christ, you must know what that word says, live what that word says, and let his righteousness become who you are. Not what you do, how, it's who you are, it's how you function. It's the life that you live every single day. That's what we must do every day. Father, in the name of Jesus, I love you. And Lord, today we've talked about your righteousness. And Father, that it is ours if we choose it, if we live it. And God, I ask you to help us today to understand what we're talking about here in a way that application follows the information, God, that we live a righteous, holy life before you before our friends and neighbors and our loved ones and God before our enemies that Lord Jesus by you we will live and know what true life is what real life is what abundant life is the abundant life is a life of righteousness a life of truth a life of salvation a life of faith God that true righteousness is, is on display it's who we are rather than just what we do or don't do is we, how we are identified. Touch us, help us, and bless us today. And let your light shine through our hearts, through our lives, and through our circumstances this morning. And we'll be careful to praise you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, please, eyes closed in the room. And for those online, let me ask you a question. Do you know Jesus Christ as your Savior? Have you asked him into your heart and into your life? If you have not, then today would be your day to make that decision to ask Jesus Christ to be your Lord and to be your Savior and to put your hope and faith in Him so can I ask you this morning in this room do you need Jesus in your life and in your heart do you need to ask Him to forgive your sins and be your Savior and become a Christian anybody in this room this morning if you'd say yes I need to do that or I need to rededicate my life this morning and get things right between you and Him once again would you lift a hand anybody in this room 
And as I must do, because I don't really have an easy way of seeing anybody online responding, because it really doesn't work that way lots of times. If you're watching this on YouTube, I wouldn't see it or know it. Um, if you're watching by our uh, church online page, then you might there might be an option there, but I'm not where I can see that right now. So let me ask you online. Do you need Jesus in your heart and life? If you do and you're ready to pray this prayer, I want to ask you to repeat this prayer after me. Dear Jesus, forgive my sin. Be the Lord of my life. Help me to live for you and to know what your love truly is in my life, in my heart, in my mind. Touch me and help me. And thank you for loving me. In Jesus' name, amen. The Bible tells me that if I prayed that prayer from my heart, according to what the Word teaches, that if I've confessed the Lord Jesus by what I've just done, that I'm saved. If you prayed that prayer, I'd love you to contact me. You can see the, the email address on the screen there, and the website also is available there. You can go there and find the information to contact us, and we'd love to hear from you. would love to know if you're in the area, we want you to come, be a part of the Calvary Temple family. If you are not in the area, I'll help you find a church uh, in your area that, that, uh, that you can go to and, and uh, be a part of a church family. We are so grateful and so blessed that you choose to watch and be with us. And for those who are part of the church family that still are watching with us online, we're glad that you're there and look forward to seeing you back here uh, very soon. And uh, hopefully we'll get all this pandemic stuff behind us soon where we can all get back in the house and be together once again. And uh, thank God for the day that comes. But let's stand if we will this morning. I encourage everybody to stay. I hope you can stay for lunch. And uh, for those that aren't with us this morning, you're missing you're missing out on a good lunch, and that's spam risk trying to call me, and sorry that works through my computer as well. But uh, uh, if that was somebody trying to call that needs to get a hold of me, then uh, I'll talk to you soon. <laughs> sorry about that. But uh, let's look at our, our, our closing verse that we use every week, and uh, thank God we, we have a word like this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you. Be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Father, today I speak blessing over this church over the church family, all those that are with us online and by DVD, and ask you to speak blessings over them as well. Today, Father God, be with us and bless us as we leave this place. And Lord, may your righteousness go before us, and may your light shine through us and in us, God, and that you'll use us to bring glory and honor to your name. And Father, that somehow, some way today, it will impact a life, and that we'll touch somebody and help somebody that would want to know more about who we are because of what they see in us that is obviously of you. Be with us and go with us with whatever we do today. We thank you and praise you for the privilege and the opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go enjoy.